Last time on The Far Away Nearby. According to my parents, raising children of the country, all cities were bad. Most of my time is really good because I spend a lot of it reading and having good cups of coffee. I was 16. I ended up uh, switching over to PBS. I found an episode of To the Manor Born. It was a beekeeping episode. But no. <laughs> that doesn't happen because it's a family function and why would anything go as planned? music that I listen to when I was young is the same music they're listening to. <laughs> and I don't quite get that, but whatever. I thank you for that illustrious introduction. Hi, I'm Jim. Nice to meet you. They drove off with a truckload that was just littering my basement and I couldn't be <laughs> more elated. Of moving to the mountains of Colorado and living in a log cabin where no one can access me, I had a good time. Well, hello, and welcome to the Far Away Nearby. I am D DJ Starsage, your host, and I am joined by the Duchess Sue. Hello, Sue. Hello. How are you? I'm well. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. And all of those out there listening to us. This is season two of our show, and we are looking forward to a just a busy lineup this year. So as you may or may not have heard, we did a special New Year's Eve show with Mr. Toppy Smelly and Brother Sinatus over at Pride48.com. And the Duchess and I have committed to doing a live show each month. So on the last Saturday of each month, we'll be joining you live at Pride48.com at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. That sounds so, good. So, okay. Well, uh, to start things off, we normally talk about our weeks. So... Uh, this is what we call our peaks and valleys for those who are new to our show. Sue, how have you been? What's new with you? Well, uh, not a lot. Um, it's a new year, and I have about gotten, I, I've got one grandchild about to graduate from the university. I think she's just got, well, I think she may have two semesters left since she has changed her major several times. In the course of her education, <laughs> she still has two semesters left, maybe three. And if she's anything like I was, she may stretch it out as long as possible. <laughs> but then I think she also wants to go to graduate school. So, But I am excited about that, that we are coming towards the close of at least one of the grandkids graduating. And mm -hmm. since my daughter did an online education she didn't really have a, a formal graduation in the sense that you could go see her walk across the stage or stand up and mix amidst the bunch of thousands of kids who are graduating oh, yeah. from any given university so this will be the first time i've actually gotten to see that since i of course myself did not do that either i was going to say a lot of people are doing online online programs nowadays mm-hmm my baby went to, uh, did a uh, course, uh, or got a degree through America Online. Mm -hmm. I think that's the name of the, the actual university. Now, are we referring to Mama Bear? Yes, we are referring to Mama Bear, who, of course, oh. is my one and only baby. Mm -hmm. and, and when I talk about the girls, I'm talking, of course, about about her two children. Right, and we decided that their names were Cleo and Red. Yes, that is true. Although at the moment her hair is really virulent. I guess virulent is a good word for this blonde. Oh. She seems to always be changing the color of her hair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. so maybe we should call her palette. Call a palette? <laughs> no, I don't think we'll do that. I think we'll stick with red. Okay. <laughs> like that. <laughs> anyway, um, yes, that's she is the mama of those two. And uh, hopefully we are not going to have any younger ones for a while. 
Mm-hmm. Which is what I had hoped she would do when she graduated from high school. But of course, she went right off, got married and had babies. But I am looking forward to, to graduating at least one child in the near future from university. And is Mama Bear excited about this, too? I think so, too, sort of. I think, like many mothers, she has a kind of torn, uh, is torn about that. Um, Of course, the further they get in school, the older they are. And and the more you lose your little babies, Mm -hmm. and they become more adult children. Of course, in some ways, it's always hard to look at them as adult children. And since Mama Bear is an adopted child for us, we did not have her when she was a real small child. So, mm-hmm. so that's a different, a, a different kind of story. She, but yes, I think we're all looking forward to having a graduated child in the family. I know my mother would be pleased since she was the, she was the only of, of my parents. She was the only the parent that graduated from college. And my husband didn't have any kids that, or have a family that graduated from college. Oh, he had one brother graduated from college. His brother went to college so he could get a pilot's license and fly for airlines. Mm-hmm. So. Right. We are talking about how your mom would be proud of. Yes. The, my uh, mother would be proud because, because uh, she and her sister are the only members of the family that I know of that actually graduated. Now I may have some cousins somewhere that graduated from university Mm-hmm. I don't know them <laughs> if they <laughs> if they did, and the same goes for my father's uh, family. I don't I don't know of any any of it, none of his siblings graduated from university, and and to the best of my knowledge, none of my cousins did. Anyways, this this was about your granddaughter. And yes. Her well, anyway, she she is she is actually going to graduate, and for that, I am really happy because that's uh, you know that's just. That's one of the things that that I had wished for my daughter, and and she didn't want to do that, based on some of the things that happened before in her life before she came to live with us, mm-hmm. um, and how she felt about the world. She had some sort of an idea that once you got a a high school diploma, you had an education, uh, which certainly did not mean the same to me. It's not the way I viewed it, but that's the way she viewed it. And so that's, uh, you know, that's just, that's just that. And, but she went on later and uh, when she was in living in a small town in Nebraska, got an online degree. I am excited to have, to have someone uh, actually graduate in the family that uh, since since mom was the only one that seemed to have managed it, I came close but didn't quite make it and and none of my siblings did. So I'm excited to be looking forward to somebody, one of mine, <laughs> I guess. Right. <laughs> graduate. Now, is, is this, um, are, are these feelings coming, up, coming about because she's getting close to her last semester? I think so. Uh, she is now at a point that she is only taking English classes, which is what she finally decided to major in. Oh. Uh, a nice, useful degree. Yes, a very a very mainstream. Although, although I keep telling her that, that English degrees are the things that most CEOs of, of companies have a major in. Mm-hmm. That that they are that their first degree was in English, and and that puts her in in uh, in, in a good place to to actually do almost anything she wants to do. Right. Uh, I'm not sure that she's decided what she wants to do, but <laughs> but I'm pretty sure she's decided a number of things she doesn't want to do. Well, sometimes that's better than nothing. It's true, <laughs> but I think she will do well at any. She she's been able to succeed at most things she's she's tried. So I um uh, I had surgery done a couple weeks ago on my hands, mm-hmm. and on my right hand I had carpal tunnel surgery done, and on my left hand 
that had this gigantic bandage on it. I had surgery on my thumb that has arthritis in it. Okay. And uh, yesterday, they took the bandages off of my right hand. So now you can see a little slice down the middle of my hand, which will pretty much go away in a few months. Because everybody else that has had carpal tunnel surgery, that happens. It it just it's just a slight little line down there. And, but and this is an audio podcast. Um, I I was going to say to our <laughs> listeners that uh, Sue and I were discussing her her war injuries here. And yes, and like I am holding up my hands, which you cannot see, my dear listeners. <laughs> it looks like the Duchess has had a run in with a sewing machine. Okay. Well, my right hand had carpal tunnel surgery, which in which apparently they just do a slice, uh, about a two and a half, maybe three inch slice between the palm, the base of the palm of your hand and the top of your wrist. And our medical students are taking notes. Okay, well that's <laughs> that's good, I guess. I I don't know, but but uh, they they took the bandage off of that yesterday because it's been about two weeks now. The okay. other hand, they did surgery on my thumb, which has severe arthritis, like much of the rest of my body. They're gradually taking all of the arthritic parts of it out and placing new parts in, mm-hmm. and. I was amazed to see, as they unwrapped the bandage, that there was these two gigantic pins, as in P-I-N, in my thumb. Oh, yes, and this is where we warn our listeners that if you are are, um, of a delicate way, you may want to fast forward through. <laughs> you, you you might want to because this is they they these pins have have are are like glass sewing pins, only they are the ones that have the glass heads on them. Okay. Uh, they they have a a what looks like a glass ball. It's about oh the uh, about the size of a marble. You know, that you played marbles with when you were a kid. Uh, not the big Aggies, not not the big ones, but the, the little, just the little regular marbles. Well, and one would hope this would prevent them from losing them. I I guess that's, that's well, there's also stuck to, st- stuck to the bottom of, the, of this l- little glass ball is a, is a large, thick pin, uh, that is about two and a half, three inches long that sticks into my hand and across to the other side of my hand through my thumb and what have you. Mm -hmm. Um, And they're real close together. So so I guess those are the kinds of pins, sort of the kinds of pins they use to hold your bones together when they get broken and stuff. Uh, Although I imagine that on broken bones, they don't put heads on them. These are the, the the heads are of course on the outside of the of the the skin and and the what have you. So will these, but uh, they took one of the pins out. Okay. And they left the other one in, and they put a cast on it like you would for a broken bone. And, and uh, the Duchess was showing it off, and it looks like her uh, upper arm is wrapped in blue jeans. Well, it's actually purple, but <laughs> but I suppose it could look like blue jeans. But and we were we were also discussing the the color of her cast because, as she'll attest, uh, one of her granddaughters is very excited to be signing that, and it, the uh, it's the color purple, which of course is the color of the anti-bullying cause ribbon, as well as my mother would attest the. Um, the lung cancer cause. Well, and these are both great causes. So I did a good job at picking the color of the uh, of the wrap. I I didn't have any. I, I mean, they apparently don't make white cast material now. Hmm. They only gave me an option of colors, and I'm going. I don't know. <laughs> and since purple is one of my favorite colors, I just 
pick that. So apparently I did a good job. Hey, yay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it has know. not been signed yet because my oldest granddaughter wants to be the first one to sign it. Mm-hmm. And she and has not been over since she is in school. Well, and then later on, the Duchess will be heading on down to the pub so that she can get some uh, creative characters to sign it. Yes, that would be, that's a good idea as well. <laughs> anyway, um, so, but it's, the the cast is, is like huge. I mean, it's, the when they wrapped it up in a, in a bandage, right after they did the surgery, it was pretty good size, but the cast is even bigger. It looks like, it looks like somebody twice my size's fist. Mm-hmm. I think <laughs> it is very large. What really happened when you were under is that they gave you a <laughs> transplant from a giant. Is that what they did? Yes. Well, that's um, how they signed the waiver. I, I I saw I saw it briefly yesterday, pins and all, mm-hmm. and it didn't look this big then. Oh, <laughs> and now it's like you know I can't fit my wrist. Or, I can't fit my right hand around my left hand. It well, only it, goes like not way even halfway around it. Well, so I it's, guess, pretty good, it's pretty good size. <laughs> I guess the healing process is kind of like those mirrors on cars that the objects may be larger than they appear. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Well, apparently the reason they put a bandage on it first was so that it would, the swelling would go down. Okay. Because it was quite quite swollen, and and by yesterday morning, my thumb was like loose. It felt like it was in a in a cup, like a coffee cup or something. <laughs> and that was very strange feeling, and and it feels a little better now. But but the cast itself is just gigantic. Now, how so, long is that? supposed to be on for the doctor told me i couldn't wash dishes for three months oh now for <laughs> anyone who doesn't know sue that well that that's that's quality time by herself is getting the <laughs> things done <laughs> it certainly is because <laughs> all my life even when i was a child people used to if i if if dishes were to be done people would run away and mm. hide and I would frequently end up being there by myself with the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> well, there there is a sh- a movie that was done a few years back, and it had Kirstie Alley and Tim Allen in it. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with it, but it basically was this well-to-do couple that were on the outs with each other. They had to make amends because, well, their accountant cooked the books. They ran off to the country to flee the IRS. Mm-hmm. They ended up being in Amish country. And uh, <laughs> it was, there were some cute moments in that movie because, uh, you, you know, you, you sort of fall back into quote unquote traditional gender roles. And Christy Alley's character was supposed to be getting to know the wife of this household that they're spending mm-hmm. time with. And because they're Amish people and it's on a farm, the quality time together was doing things like the dishes. Well, there was a moment where after they'd been there a little while and she was getting used to things, the wife of the household said to her, tonight we scrub the floors. And she says, she looks at her and she says, Oh, could we? <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> Well, so much, so much for for my week. How was how was your week? Been an interesting time around uh, Shea Star Sage. Not only am do I consider myself what one might call a retail widower, because mm-hmm. um, my husband Billy works in the retail industry, and I've come up with that term because. Anyone who has a loved one that works in that industry knows that it's a very difficult time of the year because um, despite the fact that you normally don't get consecutive days off, it's even more severe during the holidays. 
Well, yeah, um, you have this the 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 incredible need to sell up through the end of uh, up until Christmas, and then you have to you have all these sales that start immediately after that. Yeah, and it it's no wonder that a lot of the rest of the world, I guess, is what you might say, has started to look down on some of American culture because we're teaching the rest of the world bad habits. <laughs> you know, they we're telling don't people have to learn them, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, we're we're telling them basically that um, this, despite all the ages of uh, of learning that. You need to spend time together. You need to have quality time with your family and appreciate them while you have them. Now it's, um, you know, basically, screw that. I can get a deal on a new TV. (laughs) Um, So as I was saying, I consider myself a retail widower because during the holidays, I rarely see my husband that often. Part of what made the holidays so difficult for us is that the demands of Billy's job required that he be there so insanely early. And with since he has trouble waking up in the morning to begin with, it was such a challenge for him that rather than tempt the possibility that he wasn't going to get up on time and possibly run late, in a situation where there could be a corporate visit, he situated himself in the living room on the couch and had plenty of alarms laying around because when he's sharing a room in a bed with me, those alarms go off and he pays no attention to them. So I'm awake an hour or two before my day is supposed to start. (laughs) So as one might imagine, it caused a strain on us because yeah. For the duration of the holiday season, the only time he was staying in our room is on the night before we had a day off or he had a day off. Yeah. So it's like, oh, hi. Hey, hello there. Who are you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Well, you know, yeah, for, that, those things can be very stressful on a relationship. And from my perspective, I'm, I, you know, I've got a job with, fairly banker hours and Mm -hmm. I'm stuck at home by myself on the weekends. I don't have that many outlets, you know, I'm trying to get out more, but when my husband's at work most of the weekend, Mm -hmm. I feel very much alone. And I'm sure that you could get to the feeling that way too, since you guys not necessarily daytime hours. I, I found it, you know, like I said, uh, with Billy's work schedule, I found it lonely because, uh, you know, he was only sharing our room when we had a day off together the next day. And then uh, make matters worse, before the holidays, our living room was set up in such a way that we had couches opposite of each other with a coffee table in between. So mm-hmm. uh, it was like negotiating a peace treaty, come and visit my island. Yeah. <laughs> We, you know, we reconfigured the living room for the holidays, and now uh, we could sit next to each other, which we realize is important. So we're going to keep it that way. And it was just very lonely during the holidays. So where I'm, where I'm, where I'm going into from here is that I just turned forty, and anytime you have a milestone like that, you can't help but be reflective. Well, and yes. Uh, you know, it, it was uh, seven years into our relationship. We've been married five years. And the ironic part about it is that we never fight. We'll get in disagreements about things. We will get, you know, we'll get upset about something. But we tend to leave the room because we realize that standing in the same room and yelling at each other isn't going to resolve the situation. <laughs> you have to cool off. <laughs> And I think we both had abusive exes, so that's why that's our coping mechanism is that we we understand we need to cool ourselves. Mm -hmm. So so that was the low point, uh, was having to get through the holidays and sleep by myself. But uh, things are looking up, and that's where I'm going with my peak of my my week, is that I just had a birthday, and I decided... Yeah, so I just I decided to revive an old tradition in our family. 
My sister Ronnie's birthday is on the 4th, and my favorite aunt Gwen, her birthday is on the 7th. Growing up, we used to have a celebration where we observed all three of our birthdays together. And it's been quite some time since we did that. And I decided to go out on a limb. And I invited my aunt to come have a birthday with me and my sister. Now, the trouble with that is that Aunt Gwen lives a distance. And this is further than my sister Ronnie. She lives perhaps an hour away. But she, she lives in an opposite direction. And my sister Ronnie, she has expensive taste. And she likes things her own way. And her idea of celebrating my milestone birthday was to have a get-together at a restaurant of her picking. And, (laughs) you know, it would be in the town nearest her. I just decided to put it in a nicer way and say, you know, it would be nice if we could bring back that old tradition of our birthdays together. And, of course... She couldn't help but, in her own way, shoot it down and say, well, it's a nice idea, but I'm not sure if our aunt will go with it because she's in her 60s and uh, she's in an area that's prone to bad weather in the winter. And when we saw her last, last fall, she said, see you next spring. And I said to Ronnie, we have two cousins in their 20s, her daughter's. Yeah. And they are, of course, well within their means to drive their mother somewhere if she so, should so wish. Mm-hmm. Especially if it's to celebrate her birthday. I think that they owe her that much, at least, to look into restaurants uh, where Billy works, this cute little college town. Mm-hmm. And as it turns out, my mother-in-law has some experience in that area. As I've mentioned before, her parents are uh, were retired grocers. Yes. And they were very particular when it came to uh, going out dining. Mm-hmm. And so my mother-in-law told me about a restaurant that she used to take her parents to. So you know it had to be good if the retired grocer said it was okay. Yes. <laughs> Although, you know, with time, things change. Oh, yeah. But she had fond memories of the place, and it had been a little while since she'd been there last. I mean, her parents lived into their 90s, but she still uh, had taken them within a couple of years of their passing because they were active seniors. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so it was a a chance to revisit a place that my mother-in-law had some fun memories of, and it was a place that we could build some new memories. So... We took uh, we we planned it so that myself, my sister, and my aunt all got together for a birthday celebration, and as it turns out, of course, it was my aunt's sixty fifth birthday that day. Oh, so so <laughs> it was actually a birthday that same day. Now my aunt actually uh, got upset with me though on a, a minor level because as we got to the restaurant and we were all seated. She learned that my husband's birthday was the following week. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't leaving him out, honestly. My only thought behind this was reviving the old tradition of our birthdays together. Mm -hmm. When she asked me about Billy's birthday, and I said that was next week, and she looks at me. And I realized what she meant by that is that she could have brought him a card. I I could have saved her a stamp. Uh. (laughs) Um, but anyways, so we, we had a nice little get together for my 40th birthday and my aunt's 65th, um, her darling children got her a nice little gag gift that she shared online later. Um, they bought her a toilet paper holder. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It was supposed to be an age crack. Apparently. Right. I, I, I kind of got that. Yeah. So, but we, we had a good time. My my sister, uh, Betty, got to sit next to my mother-in-law, which was very important because, as I've mentioned maybe before, these are two ladies who uh, come from a similar background. They've both worked sort of factory jobs mm-hmm. and have both supported their own families. So I like to sit them together because my sister had, uh, through a divorce on her, on her father-in-law's, family um 
lost her original mother-in-law, as one might say, and she's not that close with her husband's stepmother. So uh, I, I lend out my mother-in-law to my sister because they get along. And so it's like, <laughs> you know, you, you could share my mother-in-law because I'm not a woman and I understand it's important for women to have female friends. Yes. So anyways, um, so part of my 40th birthday that I enjoyed and made up for a difficult holiday season was that my husband gave me a book, among other things, for my birthday. And it's kind of ironic how this came about, because as we're wont to do, we like to go to thrift stores. And Mm -hmm. for those of you who follow me on Instagram, I have an Instagram page where I take pictures of ironic book titles. It wasn't that long ago that Billy and I were in this thrift store and we saw a Kama Sutra. And <laughs> we just thought, oh, I bet you that's a deal. Because you never know how expensive a nice hardbound book is going to be brand new. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, this is a, a well-known book. And we even joked that Billy should get this book for his boss, who is uh, in a relationship and is on her second child. So something like that might come in handy. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So I was intrigued to see that among the gifts I received for my 40th birthday was a book of a similar nature. And this is called the Gama Sutra, the complete guide to sex positions. Now I'm reading the cover of this and I'm not sure which is okay. Uh, well, I'm not actually sure what who the what the uh, who the author is because there's two names on it. But the game is Sutra uh, says it, it's by Axel Neustadter and I believe also Bruder Gumunder. And basically, this is a same sex variation of the Kama Sutra, and within it. Um, I, I have only just gotten this recently, so I haven't really, you know, looked at it front to back. But it's it's a very interesting concept because if you happen to be in a same sex relationship, a lot of these ideas, well, maybe not foreign, but you don't think they apply in your world. And of course, when it comes right down to it, whether you're hetero or you're homosexual. It's just how your brain is wired or, you know, what channel your TV is on. So um, in part of the book, it's interesting because there are charts and much like a cookbook or an exercise book, it tells you about uh, guides to things and what you can do. But it um, breaks down people's body types. It um, associates them with types of animals. So as you learn about your body, it basically says that some people that have bodies that are more like, for example, a rabbit, Um, you know, maybe they're a shorter person with smaller limbs, or it looks like one of the animals in this book is a buffalo. Maybe a person is of a stockier build and they don't have very long limbs. And it goes on and on. But it's interesting because through the sections of the book, It tells you the different uh, positions and things that are suitable for different body types. Mm -hmm. And I guess much like an exercise book might, it tells you what things may or may not be a, uh, a good exercise per se for your body type. The other thing that it does is that it also has a section on what kind of a level you would need to be at. Like this is something that you could try on a a Monday night after work. So it's like uh, saying it's a beginner's position or, or maybe it requires you to be a little bit more in shape. So it says that this is um, Olympics and it has a little guide with symbols there telling you, you know, what kind of a challenge level that position is. So I just thought it was interesting because, you know, certainly through the holiday season, it was a challenge to get through having a room to myself of feeling alone. Whereas when we got to my birthday, I received this book 
And, you know, it, it com there comes a time in any relationship where you realize maybe we haven't been talking about things the way we're supposed to. And, of course, that's one of the things you learn from couples that have been together for any good amount of time is that the key to staying together in the long term is to be honest with each other and not hide your feelings and to talk about things that bother mm -hmm. you. This is interesting because, you know, after he realized that I felt alone, he spent his vacation from work intentionally planning out his sleeping so that we would share a room together again. Well, that's good. So uh, it, it, there was a sense of accomplishment in there in that when he realized that I was feeling alone, he made it his priority to fix that. And it's uh, it's very reassuring to know that when he puts his mind and, in this case, body to it, he can accomplish those sorts of things. Because I can tell you that the results of that sleep study saying basically there's nothing we can do for you made me feel like throwing in the towel when it came to the future and maybe having the family. Mm -hmm. And he has actually gotten to where before it there could be like six to 12 alarms going off and he wouldn't wake up. Now he's able to wake up from between a half an hour and an hour from when his alarms first start going off. And to know him, that's a vast improvement. So he certainly has a goal in mind and it looks like he is um, striving towards that. And we, you know, we, we have bit the hook. We are on that trend that everybody is after the holidays that we need to uh, get back into healthier habits. <laughs> but for us, it has a greater meaning because we, we know that all of that is the source of a lot of his problems. So so that were that was the highs and lows of my week. So um, we're going to go ahead and move on to our topics of the week. And you, you had talked about your topic was going to be your surgery there. So but Yes, and we've already discussed that, I believe, at great length. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so for my topic this week, I'm going to discuss an article that I found through this uh, site I mentioned from time to time about the news of the strange and unusual, FARC, F-A-R-K, like kite. And this particular article comes to us from the UK tabloid uh, magazine, The Mirror. Now, of course, uh, this is not a celebrity gossip story. It's actually quite a um, a, a humanitarian story. Now, the, the title of this article is quite long, but it's actually what is on the, uh, the page. It says, Inside the Retirement Home for Sex Workers, as they reveal what happens when they finally escape the streets. And so I'm going to vamp for a second here because I want to see the part that talks about the photographer here. Let's mm. see. Yeah. So this article is by Chris Kitching, and um, it's quite photo intensive. This article features pictures of women who are residents at a shelter in Mexico City. And these are all women who have worked in uh, the prostitution industry and are 55 years of age or older. Now, the article um, highlights portraits or, or photographs that are taken by a French photographer and I'm looking for the name of the photographer here. Let's see. This article is not arranged well. You have to sort of read it backwards. Well, yeah, it's like many things that, that the mirror and, and other uh, things put on the uh, on the Internet. They it has a lot of. Uh, it has a lot of, uh, you know, read this one paragraph and then uh read this other paragraph, you know, turn the page or 16 pages and, and go to the next paragraph or <laughs> what have you. It's, I think what they call it is clickbait. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> to get you interested in the story, click this picture, and you may or may not find out what you want to from the uh, headline, but, you know, you dig around enough. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, um, I might have to back up on the article because I don't see the name of the photographer. I mean, I see just a second here. Part of the name. Um, okay. So the, uh, the artist who uh, created these photographs is a French photographer named Benedict Desrousse. And this woman photographed women 55 and older in this Mexico City shelter for women have, that have worked in the prostitution industry. And what's interesting about this article is that it talks about um, how this, this uh, woman photographer had uh, taken, she had uh, chronicled basically the lives of the women in this shelter over a period of eight years. And there was actually a book that was produced on this series of photographs. Mm. The article mentions that book. So, of course, um, if one has access, the, uh, <laughs> the, the better part of this article might be that you found a, uh, a book that was more interesting than the article. <laughs> yeah. will feature some of the pictures that were in this article. So the book that the article highlights photographs from was published uh, called Las Amorosas Mas Bravas, which is uh, Spanish and translates to The Toughest Lovers. And the article states that this is co-authored by writer Cecilia Gomez Ramos. So um, this is quite an interesting article because the the pictures of course chronicle the lives of these women and it highlights the fact that this shelter is a unique place because it gives these women somewhere to be that's not on the streets and that's one of the um causes that's mentioned in the article is that the woman who founded this shelter felt a need to help women escape from the streets because if they weren't working in prostitution or possibly may not, may not be, um, you know, able to make a good life for themselves, they were living on the streets. So, um, Sue, you, you had a chance to look over the article in, in some part. I, yeah, I did. It's, it's, it's interesting. It's very short considering the number of photographs. Um, and I told you that I would look up and see if prostitution was legal in Mexico. And it has been decriminalized in Mexico. Uh, it has been regulated, what, since 1885. It has been decriminalized under government supervision since then, but uh, was vary amongst the states. There are 31 states in Mexico. And 13 of them have re regulate prostitution. It doesn't say um, it doesn't say I think the I, I'm sorry I didn't I didn't I, I didn't read the whole thing uh, or read all about it but but it uh, 13 of the states has have uh, have it regulated. I don't think it's it's illegal in other states unless you're under 18 and right. prostitution a prostitution under 18 or for minors is illegal right that's the that's the um the core of what i saw too was yeah mentions that it is regulated in those states choosing to do something about with the regulation to have a little more control have mostly just defined the age of consent yeah so, well, I think it's. I think it is illegal in all states. Under eighteen, it is illegal in all states. But mm -hmm. uh, I don't. I, there again, like much of prostitution, what are you going to do about it? You're going to lock these children up, right? Uh, many of them who might actually be better 
might have a better life if they were if somebody would just take them off the streets and put them in jail mm -hmm. uh, and feed them three times a day. Although I don't think that jails are quite like they are in the United States. So, yeah, there, there's probably most certainly not uh, anything approaching a controlled environment. Uh, yeah, I think that. Um, well, I, I think that would probably depend on the states again on on the particular state in Mexico. Because much like the United States, they have areas that are more populous. Yeah, and uh, and are going to have uh, and are going to have more government control than others. You know that Mexico is still fighting the the drug wars, mm -hmm. and and some of those areas uh, government control may not be may not be very. <laughs> It, yeah, it, it, it may not be, their, their control may not be very much. Yeah. So the other thing that this article talks about is the fact that uh, prior to the shelter's existence, this was once a museum um, to the history of boxing in, in Mexico. So um, it's it certainly had a history before it became a shelter. But the article also talks about the fact that um, it it took possibly 20 years for the lady who organized this effort to get approval to actually start the program. But it also talks about uh, the fact that this shelter is largely, if not solely, funded by charity efforts. Yeah. Yeah. Uh and that does not surprise me. It's not likely to be. I, I can't see uh, any government in the United States funding funding a, a retirement home for for uh, prostitutes uh, for aging aging prostitutes. And I, I'm guessing that Mexico has much less ability to do so than than many of the United uh, the states in the United States would. Now it says actually, and this is at the end of the article, so this is, you know, uh, quoting, it says, uh, after a 20-year fight, she finally convinced the government to open the shelter and it has now helped nearly 300 women. In 2006, the first residents moved in after Mexico City provided the building and funded funding to cover its costs. It now operates oh. public donations and funds raised by a charity created by female artists and writers. Oh, okay. Well, that's, yeah, I do, I do remember reading that, actually. <laughs> that's somewhat heartening to realize that the community is supporting it, or at least starting. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, I don't know this to be a fact, but, um, you know, from the, the um, I don't want to say non-involved, but by the, um oh what do you call it when you're out of your element not stand by but to the uh the observer maybe yeah to the outside observer one could assume that just due to the country's history that mexico has a largely catholic influenced culture so i i would assume in some part at least that with such traditional values in a religious background like that, it might be a rare and unique thing that something like this has cropped up in that sort of a culture. Well, yeah. Um, I, I don't know how much of, I, I think Mexico does have a large Catholic culture, uh, population, what have you. They also have a fair-sized Mormon or uh, Latter-day Saints population. Oh, I wasn't aware of that. Well, I, I only happen to know this because uh, one of my friends at university years ago was a Mormon oh. from Mexico. Hmm. And I remember having fights with some of her, her co-religious people. 
about um, about who her roommates were and what she and, and what she needed to do with her life and and some of those things. Thank you for listening to the Far Away Nearby. Visit our webpage at tfnpodcast.com. Find our fan page on Facebook and our companion blog on Tumblr. This show is available on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher Radio. Email us at tfnpodcast at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at tfndj. And call or text us at 720-230-6919. This show is part of the Pride 48 Network. Find more shows over at pride48.com.